So the book depository is my uh, second novel. It's just being uh, just being produced and will be available very soon. It's called the book depository, and I'm going to read a section for you. So this is called the Duchess. It was a Friday afternoon and Robert Hedrock was considering closing down for the evening when he heard the sound of vehicle traffic approaching the book depository. The ground car had the distinctive sound of the most elite and ancient kind of engine, the petroleum powered touring vehicle, the so-called sports car. Hedrock thought this one might've been of ancient Italian origin, a convertible, but he had little knowledge of the subject. Fuel used in an engine of such a vehicle must have come from off-world, for it was banned long ago on old earth. Wonder of wonders, these ancient machines were not self-driving. One had to actually work the controls. Hedrock found that remarkable. As he watched what appeared to be a beautiful human woman in her mid-thirties, by her demeanor quite cultured and privileged, and wearing a silver helmet and large gray goggles, pulled the car into a high-speed but controlled turn right in front of the shop. The car swerved to a stop, having rotated more than 180 degrees, spinning in the gravel of the road. She seemed pleased that the area was so quiet and deserted. Getting out of the car without opening the door, dust still rising, she jumped up on the seat and bounded out. She tossed her helmet and goggles recklessly into the vehicle and walked towards the great green metallic door, disregarding the signage. For reasons Hedrock did not understand, his automatic warning systems against humans failed. Pushing lightly, she moved the oversized handle and entered therein without any difficulty at all. The ding sounded the doorbell chime. From a back room behind the checkout counter and to the left side, an ancient angel emerged. May I help you? No, I'm just browsing. Of course, said Hedrock. If you require any assistance, please let me know. He went over and began to make tea. The woman, who very much looked like a human being with long flowing blonde hair and a supermodel's form and poise, and dressed in the designer clothes of the age, which were vaulted and filled with curves, explored the 800s literature. Hedrock was greatly puzzled. This customer could not possibly be human as it was very difficult for human beings to enter through the green door without Hedrock's permission. Time passed and the woman seemed to have made some selections. Hedrock would have long before closed the storefront for the day, but he did not mind keeping it open. The truth was he would have responded to a customer at any of the 24 hours. He considered it a duty, but his curiosity about the woman was also a factor. She seemed fascinated and was really exploring the stack, going through each section with interest. Eventually, she moved towards him. Hedrock was friendly. Finding everything, he said, as she approached the counter. Well, just fine, thanks. The woman set her books on the counter and Hedrock observed the titles. A Passage to Perseus by Angel K. Ramaswamy. In Search of the Kindred Soul by Nicholas of Kepler 42b and How to Better Spread the True Secret of the Egg and Why It Matters by Thomas Kempis. You know, I knew Thomas Kempis. I, Hedrock began, but the woman cut him off. I'm in a hurry. What do I owe you? 147 Kipling rupees, said Hedrock, or 223 interplanetary credits. Well, here's 200 from this pest hole of a place, said the woman, taking the books. Keep the change. She left without another word. Hedrock walked to his mahogany table and lifted his tea, still puzzled and thinking. But then, after a while, he smiled. About a month later, again on a Friday evening, the woman with the long blonde hair again approached the store. This time she was in an ordinary ground car, a taxi, and it seemed to Hedrock that she was dressed for traveling. She was sitting in the back of the sizable car alone. The ground car appeared to contain copious amounts of luggage. It rolled to a a stop nearby, and the woman sat for a moment collecting her thoughts. She got out. The ding sounded the doorbell chime. From a back room behind the checkout counter and to the left side, an ancient angel emerged. It was Robert Hedrock. His face was sad but filled with love and understanding. 
May I help you? Perhaps. I would like to buy a few more books before I leave this place. One never knows when or where a book depository will pop up. The woman stopped speaking but did not go to the stacks and continued to look at the old angel. I wonder... Hedrock paused. Would you care for some tea? Yes, I don't really drink tea, but why not? I will make it extra sweet in that case. Our Kiplingshire tea is of a kind that is hardly tolerable to someone from the outer reaches, for example, from the Kepler systems. Please come and sit down. It will take just a moment to heat the water. The woman allowed herself to be guided over to a chair at the mahogany table, and Hedrock hastily moved manuscripts and books that were all helter-skelter, finding places for them in a pile on the far counter. So, you know of me then? I'm an angel of few flaws. That might sound like pride, but it's only the observation of one who has not been patched for 250 years. However, I do have one flaw, a big one, curiosity. I am a creature of endless curiosity about things, places, and people, mostly people. After your visit last month, I asked our old biohead over there to see if he could find your likeness in the society pages. Eventually, he found a hit. Poor thing. It took him days. Thank you for that, Philip. You're welcome, said the ancient-looking head that was often mistaken for a marble bust. The woman flushed. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Olivia Vandegard. In the Kepler systems, my title is Duchess Vandegard. Before sitting down, she extended her hand, and Hedrock did the approach and formal vow that was the custom of the Kepler aristocracy. Please sit down, Your Grace. I marvel that you are not accompanied by your angels. No, I have sent them to the spaceport in a different car. I wanted to have... I wanted to discuss something with you. Of course, tell me, what is it like to pass... Hedrock spoke softly with a smile on his face, but it visibly upset the Duchess. So, my great secret that is supposed to be so well hidden, a simple bio had figured out that much? That would be bad, very bad. No, no, not at all. Your secret is quite safe from the public. Honestly, there is nothing in your demeanor or your appearance that is not wholly human. I marvel at you, but no, it is my doorman that has discovered you. Your doorman... My door is not just a door. As strange as it sounds, it was once a friend of mine. I will not tell that story right now, but anyhow, my doorman knows many things and has many capabilities. The green door does not just let anyone enter, and definitely will not allow a human being to enter unless I allow it. It's never failed. I know that in life there's always a first, but, well, what would a human duchess want with books written by angels? Mere slaves, unless... May I tell you a story? Of course, Your Grace. Hedrock got up as the water in the kettle had reached a boil. Please do not mind me as I do this domestic task. I am listening. No, stop there, please. Sit down. It is my wish that I be allowed to do the service. Hedrock turned, somewhat surprised, but said nothing and returned to the table. The Duchess rose and went over to the tea set and began to put it together. Years ago, it was during the time of the Kepler Civil War, there was a duke named Robert Vandegard. He was close to the king and had many holdings. His ducal hall was on, six, on 1649C, a planet so like Earth that you might find it hard to know you were not on old Earth. It was a marvel. The Duchess brought the tea... Oh, pardon me. The Duchess brought the tea set over to the mahogany table and began to pour placing a cup before Hedrock. Would you care for a crumpet, Robert Hedrock? Please. Robert Vandegard had a son named Noah. I met him when we were both young. I came from an egg in the house of his mother. So we knew each other from an early age. The strange thing about Noah was that even from the first moment we met, there was a connection. Perhaps because the Duke's Hall had so many angels far outnumbering the humans, and because we were blessed with more activations than one might expect to receive, he was used to angels and allowed himself to believe that we might be equals, that we might even be of the same egg, said Hedrock quietly. Yes, exactly, said the Duchess. Noah and I were like one heart and one mind in two bodies. After a time, we consummated our love, 
and Noah promised to love me forever. But the Duke did not see things so favorably. When he found out about our love, at first he laughed it off, for he knew that sometimes a young man needs to have a sexual experience or two to learn about the world. And after all, I was a slave. Noah could do with me as he pleased, within reason and with the permission of his mother's head retainer, which he had obtained before taking me. So there was nothing serious in it to the Duke's mind as long as it was not made public. But as Noah became more and more forward about our love, and showed no signs of giving it up. His father hardened his attitude towards me. He made plans to sell me to another family and get me out of the Kepler system entirely. When Noah learned of this plan, he did something rash. He took into his confidence a man of the priestly class, and we were married in secret. That seems like very extreme behavior for a priest, said Hedrock. It was, but that priest understood love, the power of forbidden love, he thought that through his action, the situation with the Duke would resolve and things might improve for all angels in the Kepler systems. It did not. When Noah told his father of our marriage, the Duke was very angry. Of course, this anger was not without cause. I knew very well it would create a terrible scandal, perhaps even a revolution, if the truth were to become known. And at that time, Noah and I, we did not want to be revolutionaries. We simply wanted to love each other and live in peace. But we also wanted to retain some of what Noah had as his birthright. That was probably our mistake. One cannot be a radical and still live a life of luxury in a palace. It was my idea that if we could find a suitable biotechnician, someone with great skill, and also, I suppose, someone willing to break the law, who could do what was required, it seemed possible I could be made to pass as a human. This plan was desperate, but the Duke accepted it as a way forward. Noah, however, was beside himself. He did not want me to change, but I think he knew it was the only way. We traveled to Old Earth so that I could have the advantage of studying more human women as I would have to understand their ways and a made-up identity would have to be created for me. I would play that part for a time. You might wonder what I was doing in this disgusting place, this Kipling Shire, but the fact is my identity was originally drawn from here. I own a house here and occasionally must return to continue the illusion of that fake identity. The plan was for Noah to return with me back to Kepler. I would take a form that would pass for human with a new identity, and we would say that he and I had fallen in love here and married on old earth. It is a thing that royals on Kepler often have been known to do, go and find a wild and garish trophy wife, trophy wife back on old earth. So the story was reasonable enough. It was mildly scandalous, but not sufficiently scandalous to bring on total disaster. Ingenious, said Hedrock. I thought so then, but I'm not so sure now. The biotech we found and employed was a strange and dangerous man named Livingston. He had been fired by Edison Angelix, but claimed to have great insider knowledge of the hidden activations and secret studies that had been done inside the company showing how to create angels that could pass. According to Livingston, he had even done this procedure before because very highly placed customers sometimes requested it. At any rate, we were so desperate we accepted his insane plan. Here, Headrock interjected with a question. Did it involve an egg by any chance? The Duchess laughed. Well, well, of course you are Robert Headrock. It does not surprise me that you could have guessed Yes, I was made to go back into the egg. It was just a surmise, my dear. I apologize for interrupting. I was made to go back into an egg. It was like a death. The required changes were so drastic that an upgrade or a series of upgrades could not achieve the result. The process was painful and I was conscious the whole time. Hideously conscious. I felt like I was being torn apart. But then came the moment of truth. My love, Noah, opened the egg with a warming beam. The egg split apart and I tumbled out. I looked at myself in the mirror and to my joy and horror, I was a human woman. My body even had hair. <laughs> Livingston said that I would not be able to pass a DNA test, but otherwise, even at the fine structure level, I am a woman. I looked at myself with satisfaction of accomplishment. I looked at myself with the satisfaction of accomplishment. 
but turning to my love, I could see in his eyes at once that something was wrong. It seemed that he could not accept me as I now was. This change did not happen immediately. It took time. But over the weeks when we were supposed to be growing together in human romance, in reality, we were quarreling. I told Noah that if he did not love me any more, then I was willing to stay here in this cesspool of Kipling, as long as required or forever if necessary. I only wanted his happiness. Nothing else mattered to me. He could be free if he wished it, and I would even die, and so close out. Sorry. He could be free. If he wished it, I would even die, and so close out this chapter, and he could start over. But Noah was a man of his word. We had married before the great God above and in his sight, so Noah and I returned to Kepler. That is pages 104 to 112 in the book Depository by David Apricot. And um, I will put a link in the uh, uh, description if you would like to buy. This is my second novel, and uh, I think that uh, some of you out there might enjoy it. Cheers.